So it's time for another episode of Mr. How Biology. This is part of the Transport Across Membrane series. And we know that that's the first topic that's coming up in that paper one where it's the biggest topic. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to support the channel and help me keep putting these videos out to help you. So today we're going to be looking at osmosis. Now let's get straight into it. What is osmosis? Well, osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential, and that's across a selectively permeable membrane. Now you can see in the diagram here, I've included a protein channel, and that's what we call an aquaporin, meaning water pour. And it's a transmembrane protein because it goes all the way across the membrane. Now this diagram is really cool because you can see those little H2O molecules there, which is, it's really nice and clear. Now we can see that the, the channel has actually got a positive charge. So those water molecules can pass right through, nice and straightforward. Now the unit for water potential is kPa, kilopascals. And it's often given this diagram at the top right or this logo at the top right, which is the Greek letter psi from the Greek alphabet. And that means water potential. So we use it for water potential. Now, what do we mean by water potential? Well, it's the potential of water to move into or out of a solution. Now, pure water has the highest water potential. And one thing that sometimes trips students up is, you know, you'd imagine a high water potential to be like 100 or something like that. But actually, the highest water potential possible is zero kilopascals. So pure water is zero kilopascals. And then anything that has a lower water potential would have a, a negative number. So it'd be, you know, minus one, minus two, something like that. Now, some key terms you need to note are isotonic, which is when two solutions have the same water potential. Think about like an isotonic sports drink, like Lucozade or Powerade. That's got the same water potential as the blood. So that's the idea behind it. Hypotonic, that's when a solution has a higher water potential. It's always relative, so you could say, you know, pure water is hypotonic compared to leucosade, something like that. Or pure water is hypotonic compared to a sucrose solution or a sodium chloride solution. Now, hypertonic is when a solution has a lower water potential than another. Now, I always tell my students, think about hyperactive. You know, you'd have more sugar. Well, that's going to lower the water potential. Now, these three diagrams are going to represent what's going to happen. So if you put a plant cell in a hypertonic solution, it's going to become plasmalized. And that's when the membrane pulls away from the cell walls as the H2O leaves the cytoplasm of the cell. Isotonic, we've got a nice balance. Water is moving in and out via osmosis at you know an equal rate. So we call that equilibrium there. So the cell isn't really gaining or losing water as a net movement anyway. Then we've got hypotonic. Now this is like if you put a cell in pure water, the water is going to move into the cell via osmosis and cause it to swell. Now if this was a red blood cell or an animal cell, it would just burst. It would, it would undergo cell lysis. But because it's got a cell wall being a plant cell, that's going to keep the boundaries of the cell membrane in place. So we just say that that's become turgid. Now, serial dilutions are one of those areas that students and, and teachers sometimes avoid because it's a little bit tricky. But actually, if we can explain it clearly now, you shouldn't have a problem with it. So if we took a 10 molar solution, so for example, if we had sodium chloride, 10 molar, okay? So moles, we're talking about concentration there, so a highly concentrated solution. If we took one centimetre, one centimetre cubed, out of that first test tube and put it in another one, and added nine centimetres cubed of water, we would have diluted it by a factor of 10, because, you know, only a tenth of it was the 10 molar, so it's now one molar. And we can keep doing that and doing that, and it gets a tenth of the concentration each time, so it gets lower and lower each time. So one centimetre cubed of the solution, of the one molar goes in, 
nine centimeter cubed of water goes in and it's now 0.1. If we take one centimeter cubed of the 0.1 molar and add nine centimeters cubed of distilled water, it'll be now it'll now be 0.01. And you could do it by halves. So you could do five and five and that just half the concentration. So if you took five centimeters cubed of a 10 molar solution and added five of water, you'd now be left with a five molar solution. And this is really powerful because you've basically diluted it massively and fairly accurately as well with a simple method. Now, a key practical you need to know about is the osmosis in potatoes practical, and this comes up in the exam all the time. In fact, you often get given a graph like this, a table of data, and you have to work out you know, ratios or, or all kinds of calculations around it. So you need to get used to this practical. It's one of my favorites, actually. It's one of my favorite graphs in A-level biology. So basically, we know potatoes are made up of plant cells. And what we can do is form potato cylinders using a, a bore and basically put them in different solutions of sodium chloride. And we can mimic or we can form hypotonic, hypotonic and isotonic solutions. So basically, if the potato gains mass, the solution was hypotonic because water's moved from the solution. So if we said these solutions here, if we put it in the 10 molar, actually, if we put it in pure water, so that, that's probably a bad example. If we put it in pure water, water will move from the pure water into the potato cell and the potato cells will gain mass, they'll gain water. Now, if we put one of the potato cells in this 10 molar solution here, water's going to move out of the potato cells into the solution and the potato cells will lose mass via osmosis. Now, what we can do is plot a nice graph that goes from positive to negative mass, so the change in mass as a percentage. We have our concentrations of sodium chloride, so we could have zero, one molar, two molar, three molar, or zero, 0 0.1 molar, 0 0.2 molar, 0 0.3 molar, and we can plot the changes in mass when we've left them in that solution, and where the the curve bisects the x-axis that's the isotonic point that's where the potato cells are neither gaining mass or losing mass so we know it's an isotonic solution so this is the method so step one is to set up a series of sodium chloride solutions i like to do sodium chloride because sucrose you could do it with sucrose but that's sticky and it ends up making all the workbenches sticky so sodium chloride is is nice and simple so you put them in beakers and that's just at least enough to cover three cylinders of potato. And you could have your 0 molar, your 0 0.1, your 0 0.2, your 0 0.3, all the way up to 1. You use a cork borer to form potato cylinders of an equal size. So we can control surface area, so that's not going to affect our results. Gently pat three cylinders dry with a paper towel. We don't want to squeeze them because we could squeeze water out of the cytoplasm and the vacuole and then we record their combined mass. We then add three cylinders to each beaker and leave it for at least 20 minutes, but 40 minutes would be ideal. We then gently pat the potato cylinders dry with a paper towel, then weigh them again and record their new mass. And if they were in a hypotonic solution, they'll be heavier. If they were in a hypertonic solution, they'll be lighter. So you can calculate your percentage change in mass and plot a really nice graph. So that's all, that's all finished with osmosis, guys. Please like, comment, subscribe, and turn your notifications on, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, guys.